So I am three days post-op from my fifth phalloplasty related surgery and this was a urethral repair surgery. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not really in any pain right now. I'm not on any pain meds right now. Mainly just my mouth is still numb because with the surgery I had, it involved taking a skin graft to heal up the problems I had down there. So I took a skin graft from here to here. I think it's natural for people to ask what what you're having when they find out that you're having a baby. They want to know, is it a boy or a girl? And if you think, um, you know, 30 years ago, people had no way of telling. There was no ultrasounds. And um, I think some people get frustrated with us. Like, we don't know what to send you as a present. We just tell them gender neutral. Hi, I'm Matt Cayley. I am a female to male transsexual. I'm also the managing editor of Outfront Colorado newspaper, one of the oldest LGBT publications in the country. I'm a published author, I'm a speaker, I'm a blogger, I'm an instructor, and I have a great life. I don't like to consider myself disabled. In fact, I generally like to not think about being diabetic at all. When I was covered by state insurance and had insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors to make management easier, small mistakes didn't matter. My absent-mindedness or forgetfulness didn't matter as much because I was receiving automatic insulin around the clock. I'd be alerted long before my blood sugar rose too far out of bounds. But prior to those advancements, and again as an uninsured adult, I no longer have that privilege. In January of this year, I used an expired insulin pen to cover a high-carb dinner and was hospitalized for three days. I woke up the next morning with a hard time breathing. You can hear it in a lot of videos when my blood sugar is high. My mouth goes dry, my throat hurts, it feels like I can't drink enough, and so I drink until my stomach hurts and I still need more. I have to use the bathroom roughly every 10 to 20 minutes. The trek to the fridge or the bathroom is a journey of its own because someone is sitting on my chest. Just sitting there, on the couch, at a desk, feels exhausting. What's worse is when the nausea hits. Even after my stomach is empty, foul, yellow bile comes up. My body rebels against water, medicine, nothing stays down. I usually go to work anyway because this is a pretty common occurrence. Expired insulin doesn't work. So even though I took more as soon as I woke up, by mid-morning, my chest was hurting in a way it never had before. It felt like my heart was being compressed. I was going to stay home, but my mother insisted that I went to the hospital. I waited in the ER for four hours. By the time I was actually admitted, I was so weak I could barely walk. I call it having acid blood, but the medical term is diabetic ketoacidosis. It occurs due to an insulin shortage, which leads to the body breaking down fat too quickly into ketones, which causes the blood to become acidic. Without treatment, it can be fatal. Now, this isn't the first time I've been hospitalized for DKA, but it was the first time that I'd been in such pain that I needed morphine. After another couple of hours in the ER, I was admitted to the ICU overnight and kept there for three more days in the regular wing of the hospital. The hospital bill was over $37,000 for that stay. Now, I typically avoid doctors for that reason, unless I'm actively dying, since the issue isn't a lack of education, but a lack of resources. I've seen my weight drop and rise drastically. I've had weeks where I could barely get out of bed because of the constant exhaustion, where I've gone through liters of water in a few hours because of the thirst. There are the other complications of long-term uncontrolled diabetes, from styes, bacterial infections, slow healing, vision changes. All of this is to say, I know what it feels like to be in a constant health decline. A lot of younger people find it hard to conceptualize what it's like for your body to betray you and to lose your health, to be unable to do things you regularly did before. The reality of living with a chronic disease is that there is no break, there is no escape, there is no easy solution and it's all downhill from here. My experience as a type 1 diabetic, a disease I've had for 20 years now, 
makes it hard for me to understand how so many women could willingly choose to disable themselves in the name of gender identity. Cross-sex hormone use is not a consequence-free choice. The endocrine system is not separate from the rest of the body, and by disrupting it, it impacts a woman's overall health. By chasing the lie that life will improve if one is perceived as male instead of female, many women are trading in their physical health in a bid to improve their mental health. Transidentified females typically seek out testosterone, mastectomies, and eventually hysterectomies in the course of their transition. The result? One study found that in transidentified females who took testosterone and anthate, all reported adverse drug reactions, which were cardiovascular events, with pulmonary embolism in 50% of cases. The median time to onset was 34 months. This means that every participant who took testosterone had a heart problem, of which half experienced a blood clot that prevented blood flow to the lung. Testosterone use was also found to cause urethocytosis, or thick, slow-flowing blood, in a tenth of transidentified females in another 20-year-long study. Another large cohort study identified that transgender people have a 40% higher risk of cardiovascular disease compared to cisgender people of the same birth sex, as stroke occurred in 0.8% of transgender men, which is 1.3 times higher compared to cisgender women. Now, a common blasé response to concerns about reproductive health is that they don't need their uterus to function. However, the body is not a Lego figure, and the reproductive system is not just for reproduction. Presumably, most transidentified females still want to be able to decide when and where to use the bathroom, and some of them may even want sex lives, even if they don't want children. So when I started hormones, um, I was taking injections and a gel, um, and the gel you rub in the armpit twice a day, and the injection is once every two weeks. That's how I started. Um, and I started having issues mostly with uh, my genitalia. Um, I had a lot of atrophy um, and swelling and, you know, having trouble going to the bathroom. And I developed rashes. Um, and I would get these giant lumps under my skin uh, when I would do my injections. And... Um, even now, years after, I mean, I haven't been on hormones in like five years at this point, almost six years, and I still have a lot of atrophy and issues with the bathroom. And when I had surgery, when I, my breast removal, um, I ended up getting a hematoma, which is uh, blood pooling under the skin. So I had to have a second minor surgery to drain the fluid and I had nipple grafts. Um, so they took my original areola nipple and downsized it and stitched it back on. Um, and one of them is deformed basically. Uh, there's a lot of scar tissue underneath it. Um, and the coloring of them is very different from typical I had no idea about any of the side effects. Um, no one, my doctor, my therapist, my surgeon, um, no one explained any of the long-term side effects of transitioning. Um, I knew that testosterone would deepen my voice and give me facial hair, but that was about all I knew. I didn't know about the risk of fertility or the, um, genital changes or issues with the bathroom or um, the bone issues. And I do want to have children. And the fact that I can no longer breastfeed um, is a huge sense of regret that I have. After starting testosterone use, pelvic floor dysfunction declines rapidly. In a study with a total of 68 transidentified females, it was found that most participants had storage symptoms, 69.1%, sexual dysfunction, 52.9%, anal rectal symptoms, 45.6%, and flatal incontinence, 39.7%. Conditions with UI symptoms reported modern severity of the condition. Another study compared the vaginal health of menopausal women and women taking testosterone and found testosterone was more damaging. This can be attributed to the atrophy which occurs of high use. While testosterone can increase sex drive, long-term use brings its own problems that will extend far beyond the bedroom. 
The San Francisco AIDS Foundation reports that testosterone decreases the resilience of the vaginal tissues and the amount of natural lubrication, which can make the tissue more prone to tearing or microabrasions. This, what we call vaginal atrophy, can make it more uncomfortable for people just walking around, and certainly during sexual activity. The vagina is an estrogen-responsive organ. When you remove estrogen, vaginal atrophy is what happens to the tissues. The atrophy doesn't happen right away. It may be months or years after being on testosterone. Buck Angel, a porn star and transidentified female, almost died due to complications of her reproductive system. She had difficulties finding providers who would and could treat her, and as a result, nearly died because, as she reports, as it turns out, the testosterone had atrophied my reproductive system, a condition that could have been prevented by the use of estrogen cream. The atrophy fused my uterus and my cervix together, along with my ovaries and everything else, creating an infection that burst and became septic. Even if the ovaries are removed, they are important to overall long-term health. In an analysis which included data from more than 1,000 females over the age of 50 in the U.S., participants who had both ovaries removed before the age of 40 showed reduced white matter in several parts of the brain, compared to 907 females under the age of 50 who had not undergone the same procedure. Participants who had both ovaries removed after age 40 also showed reduced white matter integrity, but significantly less so than those who underwent the surgery sooner. The observed changes resembled vascular brain disease more closely than Alzheimer's, the researchers note, but it's also true that these are early, preclinical features of Alzheimer's disease pathology. Recent research has also found that patients who've had both of their ovaries removed before they hit menopause face a higher risk of cognitive impairment and dementia later in life. This isn't a conclusive list of side effects of testosterone use. Longitudinal studies are still being conducted. The population of women seeking these hormones and surgeries has suddenly increased, and even with increased attention on the topic, it will take years to see results in accurate data. That is, if studies are being accurately conducted and the results are not prevented from being shared. And even if they are, it's probably not to be given to prospective transitioners anytime soon. Many transidentified females do not have informed consent when they start the transition, or are not able to give it to do their age or poor mental health. However, others are aware of the existence of studies which illustrate harm, or of personal testimonies that illustrate this reality, and still insist on hiding it. They pretend that transitioning is both a casual choice of no health repercussions, and yet one that all happiness hinges on, and, as a result, lead many young women down a path to inevitable disability. As someone who hasn't had a choice in being disabled, the decision to undertake action that will lead to disability is needlessly reckless and, quite honestly, despicable. Health is very easy to lose and difficult to regain, and so many women are trading in their health for a lie. But yeah, it really sucked because I was not able to stand to pee for eight months. I actually could not pee on my own. I had a catheter and a bag attached to me. It was kind of nice though, I'm not gonna lie, like at night, I didn't have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. A lot of times we just stay in bed and not have to go because the bag was catching it for me. So I actually kind of got a little bit lazy <laughs> and used to the catheter. I was like, well, might as well make the most of it. And everyone else is like, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. And I'm just like, <laughs> sit on the couch. But it was a really rough recovery, especially mentally. I got through it, finally got the catheter out, eight, nine months. Happy to report, I can stand to pee just fine. I do miss from time to time though. This, dear viewers, is where we part. Um, I don't know where this will come out in terms of editing because I'm doing a bunch of reads all in one night just so I can have the audio ready, but this is probably coming out relatively close to my hospital stay. And as someone who's had my, a health decline over the past couple of years, I've gone from being able to, to do very long hikes, lots of physical activity, to feeling exhausted almost constantly, to having all these side effects, these small little ailments. And I've noticed there's a lot of trans men who are dying young. Transidentified females who go on testosterone and they kind of like fade out of sight. After a certain age, you still see a bunch of older transidentified males, but the transidentified females really kind of fade out after like 
late 20s, early 30s. And I've noticed that, like, anytime there's a detransition, you're talking about health issues, it's, well, you should have known better, and how dare you complain. And it feels like they're really, they're really making it difficult to make informed consent, especially with so many people getting their information on transition from TikTok, from social media. They're not really doing real research. They're not really reading these papers. They're not going through these studies and seeing, oh, this was funded by a trans a uh, company that focuses on hormone use, so maybe this study isn't as useful, or this one only has 30 people in it, and, and you know, 20 of them didn't follow up with anything. They're not reading through the actual studies and getting the real information. And there's a lot of information we just don't have to give just because there wasn't this huge population of female transitioners until relatively recently. And it's one of those things where, like, if you spend a lot of time on this topic, you've noticed it anecdotally. You'll notice it just noticing people disappearing, these certain stories. And it's just always frustrated me that, why would you choose to take an action that would disable you? Now I get it, there are vices like smoking and drinking that may have a chance of leading you to have a decreased health later on. But that's different than the 100% certainty that you will face some sort of disability, some sort of drastic change when going on hormones. And I just find it very frustrating. You have a choice there that not everyone does when it comes to having a disability. Anyhow, if you guys have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can let me know in the comment section down below, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!